Uh, it's great to be here. We uh, arrived here uh, Monday night uh, with two flight crews. Uh, we actually got to sit in the back on the flight out. Uh, Tuesday night, we flew a mission that lasted 10 hours, landed at 6 in the morning, and uh, got a few hours of sleep, and we're with uh, a lot of the students yesterday signing autographs, and we just fed on that energy, and just it just kept us going all the way through dinner, and then promptly passed out soon after that. Uh, Manny Animaceras, I'm a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, uh, flew several airplanes under my belt. I also did the airline thing for about 10 years and started with NASA about 10 years ago and actually been flying on Sophia for about seven years. Dean's a retired colonel in the Air Force. He's flown a lot of different airplanes he'll talk about later. And uh, he's been with Sophia and NASA, what, six years now? Five, five, five years. And Matt Pitch is also retired military and he's our flight, in, uh, flight engineer and also does a little bit of instructing on both Sophia and our DC-8 Airborne Laboratory. So uh, thank you for having us here. This is really a great opportunity. Sophia's airborne right now, chasing the uh, Triton occultation as we speak. Took off on time, some challenges late, very late before, just before takeoff, but uh, flight crews and mission planners handled it. They actually had to do a little bit of shifting on the uh, proposed flight path to what they're actually doing right now. And uh, so they're hopefully successful on intercepting that occultation tonight. Hopefully the weather will cooperate. Um, so today, the way this is going to work, uh, we've got a presentation built, a uh, couple of embedded videos in here. I'm going to run the first half of the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Dean's going to take over the second half, and then we're going to open it up to questions from you guys. We'll leave plenty of time for that. So I'm going to get going right now. Uh, there's a short video here, basically encompasses what we do at Dryden as a whole. So enjoy the video. There is some sound, but it's just music in the background, so if it's not, it is working. Cool. I think all of you know about NASA, is that correct? Yeah. How many of you knew there was a NASA center in Southern California? Yeah. Our focus is advancing technology and science through flight. And what we do is we take ideas, really, and we turn those ideas into, into reality.
That's it, isn't it? All right. So that's what we typically, uh, what's what I like to call a typical day at the office. Uh, this video was made in-house by our own videographers, uh, represents about 1,200 people doing about 300 different jobs out there at the uh, high desert of California. Uh, I'm going to focus my talk on Sophia tonight, then Dean's going to take over for the second half and talk about some of the other projects that we're involved with. Uh, so Sophia is a lineage of what started out as a Learjet. Uh, moved on to a C-141 cargo airplane and then moved into Sofia, which is a converted 747. Next one. So here's the uh, size difference. The Learjet carried a very small telescope. The KAO, the Kuiper Observatory, carried a one meter primary mirror and ours is two and a half meters. Uh, next slide shows what the Learjet looked like and it was just a small telescope poking out a port on the side of the airplane. Gave them about three and a half to four hours of observing time when they were flying this airplane. Uh, next one, this, the 141 gave them a little more flexibility. Uh, several hours in flight uh, with the uh, telescope mounted up front. There's an interior shot right here, Dean. There it is. Uh, with the telescope mounted up front, they had to build a giant metal box around it so the alleyway between the cockpit and the back of the workstations was very narrow. Uh, also made the airplane very loud I, from people I've talked to they said it was not the most comfortable ride going but they did a lot of good work there uh, next slide shows the size difference between the KAO and Sophia and you can see we've got a lot more room to play with bigger telescope uh, next uh, the Sophia program itself has been uh, operational now for coming up on eight years uh, I was involved with it right at the beginning during early flight tests as a navigator in the back, uh, we had an old cockpit with not much uh, functionality with the nav system, so we carried a navigator, and I got hired on as a pilot about seven years ago and been on the airplane ever since. Uh, started out as a Pan Am airliner, um, and then got uh, sold to United Airlines when they took over the Pacific routes from Pan Am when they went bankrupt, and then uh, the airplane uh, was donated to United, to uh, NASA as a conversion. Uh, met this young man during one of our open house visits up at uh, Ames Research Center in San Jose. Uh, this is Ben Smith. He was 94 years old when this picture was taken, and he came up to me and said, Son, is that really Clipper Lindbergh, or did you guys just paint the name on there? And I went, No, oh, sir, it's really Clipper Lindbergh. He says, I was a captain at Pan Am, flew that airplane 45 times around the world. So I begged somebody to take our snapshot, and it became weekly phone calls from him. How's my airplane doing? How's Sophia doing? He was so excited to learn about what was going on. Uh, lived to the ripe old age of 97, sharp brain all the way to the end. He was a World War II fighter pilot, so it was a real honor to meet him. Um, next slide. Uh, the original design for Sophia actually had the uh, telescope mounted up front, uh, but through uh, analysis they discovered this was going to be too much weight, too heavy to put, put all that up in front of the nose, so we went to uh, a rear design. And here's a, a nice cutaway drawing. Upstairs in the cockpit area, two pilots and a flight engineer, standard 747 type, uh, you know, uh, work workstations there. Downstairs is where all the work really happens. We carry uh, two mission directors that run the whole show down there, several telescope operators, and then we carry our customer, the astronomers, and they get as much or as little desk space as they want down there. Usually one dedicated console closest to this telescope is their workstation with their power supplies and their instruments. And the instrument is mounted, uh, as you see right there, science instrument. Seven different instruments now are certified to fly on Sophia. They weigh anywhere from two to 3,000 pounds each. Uh, all cryogenically cool with either liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. Uh, one of the instruments I know is just a fraction of a degree above Kelvin when it's working. And the instrument itself, the telescope itself, is a 20,000 pound telescope, or actually, sorry, 20 metric ton telescope, nearly 40,000 pounds, carrying the two and a half meter primary mirror. Completely gyro stabilized and balanced to even in moderate turbulence, the telescope is perfectly still and focused on its object. Next slide. Just a little size comparison and how large this telescope is. Uh, I get asked a lot, well, what's it like with that much weight in the tail of an airplane? Um, all of the computers that drive this thing are mounted up front, and we even had to mount lead ballast plates mounted underneath the floor in the lower lobes to, to balance everything out on this airplane. Uh, here's a picture with the door open in the hangar, and you can see the primary mirror right there. It's two and a half meters wide, one piece of glass. There is no replacement. So no pressure on us to make a smooth landing. 
uh, bounces up to a secondary mirror, then to a tertiary mirror, and then in through the nadir tube and into the instrument. Um, we fly for about 10 hours on a typical mission. Go ahead. This is what it looks like on the inside of the airplane, standing in front, looking towards the back. Everything in blue is the telescope, and the red is the instrument that happens to be bolted on to that telescope uh, at this moment. And you can see all the different workstations and everybody's uh, you know, workstations there. Next slide. So here's a better close-up view. This instrument just happens to be from Cornell. And again, everything is cryogenically cooled. That plastic bag you see that's inflated is just to show the cryogens that are boiling off during a mission. When the bag's deflated, we're pretty much done for the night. The, the uh, instrument gets too warm and it can't see uh, in, infrared heat out in deep space. Um, again, and this is what the uh, nadir tube looks like without a telescope, without the instrument bolted onto the telescope there. Uh, it's so finely balanced that when the bearing is pressurized, I can actually move that 40,000 pounds with just two fingers, move it up through its range of motion. The telescope can go from about 22 degrees all the way up to 65 degrees uh, during the flight. Has very little left and right movement, so we actually have to physically turn the airplane. So all night during an observation, we're making one degree heading changes all night long, coordinating with the mission director downstairs. So we're adjusting our flight path through each, uh, each leg on each night. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2006. It was converted out in Waco, Texas. Took about 10 years to basically cut a hole in the side of an airplane and start modifying it. A lot of analysis, a lot of structural mods went into uh, doing this. And first flight out of Waco in 2007 when uh, we got the airplane. Go ahead. And it arrived uh, at Dryden, which is now Armstrong Flight Research Center in 2007 and we started doing envelope expansion flights because nobody could really tell us and this is what uh, parked in front of some of our F-18s but uh, during the early analysis nobody could really tell us well what's it going to be like when this door is open in flight if you've ever opened just the back window on your car you get that reverberation and that buffeting that's what everybody was worried about especially the structural dynamics guys so we on the first couple of flights we uh, go ahead one more we did a series of flights that lasted almost a year where we just cracked the door open just a little bit, flew at slow speeds, and increased not only the speeds but the door opening till we get to a fully door open flight in 2009. All the black dots you see on there are, are sensors that were telemetry and data down to our control room and they, oh, we had all these structural guys analyzing all the spikes and graphs to make sure that the airplane wasn't shaking itself apart. What we discovered was it's completely benign. In fact, uh, we had a couple of people on the airplane from your newspaper, hey, when's the door opening? And Matt had just happened to be hitting the switch right then to open the door for, for science. We're like, it's opening right now. Uh, there's no change in vibration. There's no noise increase. There's no handling quality changes. The only way we can tell upstairs whether the door's open or closed is from one little light that's on his panel. Uh, there's no other way to tell. Go ahead. Uh, we also, during our testing, insisted on a door open landing. This got a lot of people very nervous because they didn't want anything kicking up from our tires and hitting the mirror and breaking that one mirror. Uh, but we insisted on it. They assured us that the door would never malfunction. It's got a mean time between failures of the life of the program. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. And we said, no, we're still going to do this. And in the first year of operation, we had five door open landings due to a software glitch. So. Again, completely benign, no, no issues with uh, landing the airplane with the door open or closed. We couldn't tell the difference. It actually flies just like a normal 747. Go ahead. Just some shots in Palmdale taking off on a mission. Uh, go ahead, just flash through those. And then uh, we also, uh, okay, so why airborne astronomy? Obviously, we're in the infrared spectrum and moisture is the enemy of infrared. We have to get up above the Earth's atmosphere, above the clouds get into some clear air to get to uh, astronomy. Uh, that's in, in the infrared spectrum. Uh, basically, two shots of the same Orion Nebula, visual versus infrared, visual spectrum versus infrared. You can see how much more of a spectrum is available in the infrared range, and how, why, that's why we're doing infrared. Go ahead. Uh, why airborne? Because water vapor is concentrated at lower altitudes and we're getting up above 98 to 99 percent of the Earth's moisture when we're up at altitude. Uh, typically we start at around 37,000 feet and as we burn fuel and get lighter we step climb up through the night, get up as high as 43,000 feet. 
we can get can go up to our ceiling which is 45,000 feet but by then we're so low on fuel it's really not worth it and we're starting our descent soon after that so usually 43 we're good there about the last three to four hours of each mission go ahead um, some of the history uh, we discovered the rings of, Ur of uh, Uranus with KAO evidence of a black hole in the Milky Way water in Jupiter and the Pluto's atmosphere and then we'll touch on a little bit of that in a second here uh, some of the first light images we flew were just let's go out and see what we can see with this thing and although the uh, image on the right looks a little fuzzier in the infrared spectrum there's a lot more information going on there um, kind of hard to see this with this lights on but visual near infrared and what the forecast instrument mounted on Sophia is seeing and as you can see in the infrared spectrum you're getting a lot more data Next one. Again, what we're looking at, galaxies, formations of stars and planets, planetary science, Milky Way, and uh, go ahead. And this was one of the missions I was on. I actually ran downstairs to go see this. It was a supernova photographed from 11 million light years away in a moving airplane going 550 knots. And I was just like, could not believe what the astronomer told me. Uh, I touched on this a little bit. Crew anywhere from, I've seen as little as 10 to as many as 45. It all depends on the needs of the customer and what's going on that night. Um, fuel loads, if you want to throw some stupid numbers out, the airplane empty with no fuel, no people on it, weighs 380,000 pounds. We typically take off with a 240,000 to 260,000 pounds of fuel. We typically take off at 640,000 pounds. We can go up as high as 700,000 pounds. And we land with uh, just under 30,000 pounds typically around 20 to 25,000. 16,000 is our minimum fuel and 12,000 pounds or 3,000 gallons is fumes for us, if you can imagine that. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a nice slide. My boss hates it when I talk about this one. Typical airline profile is in red and this is their optimum fuel. They'll cruise at lower altitudes with uh, low power settings. We don't do that. We burn gas because we're not paying for it. We're the government. He hates when I say that. Uh, no, our business is to get up in science. So we have to run our engines at higher power settings so we can get to higher altitudes and get science. We're not here to make a profit. We're here to get science. So we typically on our flights climb as soon as is possible according to our performance data to the next higher altitude. And because of that, we're running our engines at higher power settings and we burn gas. Uh, some of the computations we just did the other night to convert it to what you guys are doing here with the flying program. In the first hour, I'm burning 165 gallons a minute. Uh, during cruise, I'm burning 65 gallons a minute. And again, I touched on 3,000 gallons as fumes. Uh, typical profile, there is no typical profile. This was just one of the missions I was on. Because the telescope can't move left and right, every leg on here represents a different object we looked at. So you can see that in the middle of one mission, we can look at several objects in one night. Now I've also done where we just flew out towards Hawaii from California, looking at one object, turn around and come back. It all depends on this, the needs of the science and what they're looking at. Go ahead. Uh, Bonus part of the job is two months out of the year, we get to go to New Zealand. We operate out of there for southern hemisphere observations that can't be done up here. So we go down to the uh, Antarctic Center at Christchurch, New Zealand, operate out of there. Usually we split the deployment in half. You know, one crew will do first month and a set, another set of crews will do the second month, so we're not gone from home as much. Plus the other reason is we're also involved, all three of us, on other projects, other airplanes, the entire flight crew force at, at Armstrong is involved on several airplanes. I fly one other airplane, Dean flies three other airplanes, Matt's also on another airplane. So as soon as we get home, we're on the next project. So they don't want us gone too long. Some more pictures here taken in New Zealand just recently. Uh, great working out of there, really good food, really good people. If you ever get a chance, go down there. You'll have a lot of fun. Uh, ready, you know, take off pictures here. Again, all out of New Zealand, it's pretty cool. Um, why New Zealand? It's cold, it's dry, there's very little moisture down there. I've actually had astronomers tell me it's like watching something from Hubble. The, the moisture levels are, are so low down there, it's like being in space. They absolutely wish that we could be there 24-7, 365. We just can't do it though. Uh, less background radiation, dry conditions, like I said, space-like. Go ahead. Uh, the other cool part of it is we get to see the Magellanic Cloud, the, uh, um, Magellanic Cloud is what they're looking at, and we also get to see the uh, Aurora Borea, uh, Australis down there, the southern lights. And a couple of flights, we've had some very active Aurora. So we got, I actually got to take a picture of this through some night vision goggles, because the cell phone cameras just don't capture it well enough. Uh, Pluto, okay, so the next slide. 
Uh, our specialty is an occultation. We can position the airplane to where an occultation's shadow is going to fall. In fact, right now, as we speak, Sophia is out intercepting Triton, Triton, uh, the Neptune's moon right now in the shadow that's happening. The shadow's falling in the middle of the Atlantic. We can actually position the airplane to intercept that shadow. Uh, when we did Pluto, the uh, shadow was moving across the Earth at about 53,000 miles an hour, and they gave us about a 10-second window. So we usually carry a nav on board just for an extra set of eyeballs and because he can get his displays down to plus or minus a couple seconds and we were able to position the airplane on a typical 10-hour flight, we can intercept that shadow. And on this uh, intercept, we actually nailed it to within a half a second off. Uh, the neat thing about when we did this was we discovered that Pluto has an atmosphere and what it's composed of. So then I, of course, not being an astronomer, said, well, why isn't it a planet? So you know, a whole many, <laughs> moment, bunch of reasons not to do that. So next slide. Uh, this was the Pluto occultation mission out of New Zealand. And again, even though we flew up there just to intercept that occultation, there was other objects. Again, every leg is, you know, a different object. Now you can see on this long leg, it's curved. Again, uh, Coriolis and all that and stars moving, we got to make heading changes to inter keep that thing in the center of the field of view of the telescope. So all night long, the pilots upstairs, we got autopilot on to keep it as stable as possible, maintaining our airspeed to uh, keep the uh, envelope of the airplane safe and one degree at a time, as the mission directors downstairs are telling us, then they center up everything back in the field of view of the telescope. So all night long, I'm reaching up going, one degree, one degree, one degree. Okay, yep, this is fun. A lot of coffee, a lot of coffee. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, and I'm gonna let Dean take over from here to talk some, about some of the other projects going on. All right, thanks, Manny. Yeah, so uh, you guys have been exposed to uh, Sophia, the big beast here in our astronomy jet. Um, at, at NASA Armstrong and up at NASA Ames up in the Bay Area, uh, that supports a lot of the projects that uh, we work with. There's actually a lot of other efforts going on there. And at, uh, at NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, we've got a whole garage full of toys. You've seen a few pictures uh, of a few of them here and the other things we get involved with that support all different projects. Uh, to us, it's not just about astronomy. We do a lot of different kinds of research and flight tests. This one, uh, uh, the one he showed you there, is a, a low boom demonstrator. So we do a lot of uh, supersonics testing. You saw a couple of pictures of an F-15 there with little blivets underneath. Uh, and uh, we, we need jets that will take those things supersonic so we understand how they behave uh, going through the air and then the effects of the atmosphere as well. And that's what this one's all about. In the future, when we have multiple supersonic airliners tra traveling through the same airspace, we need to understand what we can do to lessen the effects of shock waves, not only between an airplane and the ground, setting off car alarms and breaking windows and stuff, but we've also got to know how is that going to affect other airplanes flying through the air, whether the other airplane uh, be a subsonic aircraft or a supersonic. So <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about a uh, project here that's leading toward that demonstrator. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was down in, uh, at Kennedy Space Center uh, doing a, a project, what we called Sonic Boom, or Sonic Bat, and it's, uh, we were looking at uh, shock waves and the effects coming down through the air. We've done a lot of study uh, everywhere on the effects uh, and the intensity of shock waves as they travel from different altitudes generated by different aircraft and uh, when they get down to the, the Earth's surface. What there hasn't been is a lot of study on the effects in between and going through different types of air, dry air, humid air, turbulent air, and out where we work in the uh, high desert in California, we pretty much have clean, dry air all the time. And so we needed to come out here to the East Coast where the, uh, the scientists and the engineers wanted to see how shock waves travel differently through turbulent air and humid air. So we were down there near where all the, uh, the rocket launch pads are and uh, operating out of the, uh, the shuttle landing facility uh, for a few weeks. We would send an F-18 up in the air uh, if you met uh, Jim Les Clue, one of the other pilots, he's the one actually flying the occultation in Sophia right now uh, that's going to happen in about 30 minutes uh, out over the Atlantic. Uh, he flew the F-18, he would take it up to about 40,000 feet, dive down, go supersonic at 32,000 feet, and I would jump into this, uh, this monster here, this little two-person, uh, thousand-pound motor glider with the little 100, 100 uh, horsepower engine on the front, that uh, pretty much turns a little bit of fuel into some uh, wind through the canopy. 
and take that up to about eight to 9,000 feet, just above where you would find uh, turbulent air. And it's hard to tell in this photo, but what the person on the left is looking at is a microphone boom, similar to this, sticking out of the left side. The reason we want to use this airplane is because it's a motor glider, so we can take it up to altitude and actually turn the motor off and make it quiet. So it's nothing, effectively, it's just a microphone like this floating through a point in space and then recording the intensity of the shock wave. So I'll fly in the right seat. There's a flight test engineer in the left seat with a little uh, laptop and some software wired into that microphone. And we calculate how the shock wave is gonna travel from the F-18 down through our airplane so I know what point in space I need to be at, what altitude and what time. So that's the fun part for a pilot is to figure out how you're gonna glide now that you've turned the engine off and make sure you're at the right place at the right time. We measure this, and then the uh, shock wave will come down through, get recorded by the TG-14 motor glider once, and then it bounces off the surface and comes back up. So about five or six seconds apart, there's another boom that comes across. And that is all gonna go into going back to, okay, based on the intensity of these, uh, shock waves, how can we better design aircraft? And you, you go back one slide, Manny, to the, uh, the low boom demonstrator. So this X-plane that we're getting ready to start building out there, notice the real long nose on it. What we've found over time, and you guys are gonna be learning about some of that here probably, is that having a real gradual uh, taper on the shape of the aircraft will actually lessen the intensity of a shock wave as the plane goes supersonic. If it's more of a blunt uh, um, shape, you're gonna have a, a pretty uh, intense uh, instantaneous pressure change, and that's what's gonna create the shock wave. What we wanna do is lessen that, make it more of a gradual development as the, the transonic region goes across the body, and then uh, essentially to, to most people standing around, that just means a quiet, quieter boom that you're gonna hear on the ground. The next couple slides there, please. Yep. All right, another project we've got going on here. Uh, one of our early Sophia test pilots, uh, who uh, is not flying that one anymore because he flies just about everything else in the inventory, uh, he is the uh, lead pilot uh, for this electric airplane. This is one in development also. This one's a little bit different. What we did was we started with an existing aircraft design and we're taking the motors off and then putting electric motors on it. So this is kind of the flying Tesla that uh, we're gonna have, uh, we've already got the airplane, we're putting the electric motors on and that'll fly for the first time uh, sometime next year. This is how the wing was tested. What's that? This is how the wing was tested. Yes, and so if you look up on the top of the stand, out on our dried lake bed, just outside the office there at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, we do a lot of uh, testing out here, and this is where they tested putting multiple electric motors. Uh, all, so they're small motors, but several of them down the wing of this model. And this, so this isn't the aircraft itself, but this was uh, some of the buildup testing we did, figuring out how this was gonna work and what the effects were, looking at what happens when you lose one or more motors and the, uh, the effects of the aircraft. So this, uh, this phase of the study is complete. Next slide. All right, here's another one. Uh, Manny used to fly this one. I, I fly this one also, and uh, they call it UAVSAR because it's a synthetic aperture radar that was designed to go up on, a, on an unmanned aerial system. Uh, so far, that hasn't happened yet because Global Hawk was the platform it was supposed to go on, and it's not quite ready. So we fly it around on a C-20, which is actually a Gulfstream G-3. What we do with this one, is we take it all over the world. Uh, I've been to uh, Japan, Iceland, Alaska, uh, several places where we'll go uh, look at either, uh, when we go up north, we're using it to uh, look at topography and changes in topography. It's got a system on board that's a modified autopilot where we can, and we have tablets uh, in the cockpit where we can fly this airplane onto an exact point inside a, a straw, if you think of it that way, uh, that's only about 10 feet in uh, diameter. And we've got to fly it real precisely into that tube, and then we can couple up this modified autopilot where it'll keep it on that straight line. And the magic of that is we can come back to the exact same uh, line through space, either a day later or six months later, and this radar will look down at the exact 
uh, point on the ground and we can detect even one centimeter or two centimeters of movement or change on the ground, whether that be uh, plant life or like in California when we look at earthquake fault lines, we can help predict if something's about to happen, if things have moved a little bit. Uh, with flooding, yeah, we've flown out over the southeast quite a bit, looking at some of the levees and looking for changes that might indicate that maybe there's about to be a levee break and there's going to be some flooding involved. Uh, we take it up north looking at glacier movements and the rate of melting. Um, we look at volcanoes as well. Uh, we take it out to Hawaii or that uh, over to uh, Japan as well, looking at all the different volcanoes, looking for just minute changes where we can better predict what's going to be happening on our Earth's surface. Next slide. All right. Shows the shift after the Mexicali quake. Yeah, here's, here's a good look. Uh, back in 2010 when that earthquake happened, uh, some of the shift, and I'm not sure how this was measured actually, uh, or if maybe Manny just got some crayons and colored the map yeah, in here. Yeah, but, uh, might, yeah the truth is out. No, actually the rainbow stuff on the bottom of the slide shows the shift in the tectonic plate after the Mexicali plate. The stuff up in the northern part there is garbage It's because it's out of the scope, out of the field of view of the radar. But they concentrated on the sharp rainbow areas down here and they could detect how much the Earth's crust had moved after the Mexicali quake. I still think you did a nice job coloring that in with your crayon set there. <laughs> Some of the spin -off. All right, and, uh, and Manny, actually, if you want to run through a few of these yeah. things, these are, he gathered a few things. What we want to talk to you a little bit about here is then beyond uh, so what all the research we've done. What's the so what and the takeaway from that? And here's uh, some examples of some of the, the technology that NASA has pushed forward that's actually in use every day. Yeah, a lot of it was uh, the spinoff is uh, on your cell phones, not only your camera, but the GPS inside your camera is actually from a NASA-derived project. GoPro cameras, the stabilization, again, from, uh, from a NASA-derived te uh, technology. The uh, braces there, clear ceramic braces, uh, are also uh, derived from products that were used during some science experiment. Winglets on all airplanes are actually a NASA modified, uh, modified test program, and it actually saves between 3 and 6 percent fuel burn on a typical airline flight. Airliners, and I spent 10 years in the airline industry, they will beg for 1 percent increase. So when these winglets came out and said, we can save you between 3 and 6 percent, you, you hardly ever see an airplane anymore without a winglet on it. And then the uh, fireman there, the uh, synthetic fibers inside his uniform are derived from some of the uh, astronaut uh, pressure suits, uh, helping lightweight and fire protection all at the same time. And there's a lot more. If you just Google NASA spinoffs, you'd be amazed at how many common things you use every day that you, you know, are actually from uh, NASA technology that are spun off. Um, I guess I can talk to this too. I'm going to show you this video in here. One of the highlights of the spin-off technologies is actually being used by F-16s, F-15s, all the fighters in the fleet right now. Uh, this was an actual head-up display video from a student in an F-16 being chased by his instructor. Um, I'll play the thing first. There's a lot of information going on at the same time. And then I'll freeze it, play it back, and I'll show you know I'll really get into what you're about, you know, what you're going to see the second time, and you get more information of it. I'm just going to play it first time for effect because it's pretty intense. Two, get yourself back above the floor. So, I'll, I'll uh, let me get this to the point where I can freeze it and point out some symbology on his head up display. Okay, 
So uh, let's see if the mouse, okay, so this is his G's, how many G-forces he's pulling. If you've ever done a loop in a roller coaster, that's about three and a half to four G's. You'll see this increase. This is his airspeed over here. Uh, right here is the altitude barometrically and how high above the ground he is. So this was a student, he had already flown in the morning, no problems, no issues. Second sortie, the first thing they do is they do a G awareness turn. How many G's can I pull today? He gets up to about seven or eight G's and passes out. It just happens, guys pass out. Uh, the airplane at that point is totally uncontrolled and when you hear the instructor screaming to recover, he, the number two is already passed out. Okay, now we've developed a program, it took over 10 years for one of our guys, his name is Mark Skoogs, that invented this thing. Halfway through development, people were like, dude, you're wasting your time, you know, why are you, you know, still working on this, this goal, this quest? And what you'll see is two carrots come together towards the screen and when they form the letter X, it's the airplane taking over automatically. This is called automatic ground collision avoidance system. And this has already been credited with saving five fighter pilots lives. Uh, we actually got to meet this guy. He came out, he wanted to shake the hand of the engineer that invented this thing. And then he said, please don't tell my wife, my son, and my unborn daughter. They don't know yet. So I'll, show, I'll continue playing this and you'll see the symbology. <laughs> So right there, you'll see he's pulling about just over eight Gs. Ah, oh, I blew it, sorry. Sorry. Technology, a wonderful thing. And right now he's passed out. You'll see it go down to one G. He's just basically floating out of the sky. He's upside down and the nose is pulling. Feel recover. Feel recover. Feel recover. So there's the X. <laughs> Okay, that means that, that X means that the computer has taken over because it knows how high above the earth the uh, airplane is. It knows the terrain database and it's like, you're done. I'm taking over, I'm flying for you. He is still passed out. Okay, he has not recovered from the effects of G loss yet. Uh, the interesting thing is when he says get back up above the floor, he's still waking up from that stupor, getting that blood to go back up into his brain. If you've ever studied any kind of uh, physiology, aerospace physiology, you'll see when a guy passes out, it's a good 20 to 30 seconds before you're back to 100% again. We recover. So at this point, the airplane's still flying, climbing him up. And he gets back up above 12,000 feet. When they call knock it off, that means the sortie's over. Come home, we'll talk about it. You know, he didn't even realize he had passed out until the airplane was already recovered. And like I said, the technology there developed by Mark Skoogs has already saved five guys' lives. Um, the, early on, the fighter pilot community was like, what do you mean a computer's gonna fly my airplane? No way. And now they're like, when, when are we getting this fleet wide? So all the fighters, F-16, F-15, F-22, F-35, it's gonna become a standard thing for them. And that pretty much is it. And now we're opening it up to you guys for questions, please. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> Go ahead. You guys did a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to be curious, what's the connection with Germany? Oh, I should have brought that up in the beginning. I'm sorry about that. Yes, Germany built the telescope. We built the airplane. It's a 20-year partnership with us. They've absorbed 20% uh, of the cost, and Americans are paying for about 80% of the cost. And one of the instruments that gets bolted onto our telescope is a German instrument. It's called GREAT. It's the German receiver at terahertz frequency. And Rolf, who's the primary investigator, gets a kick when I call it the German really expensive astronomical thingy. So <laughs> I saw more hands come up. We're here all night. Go ahead. What's the long term? Uh, it, it is a 20 year program. We're about uh, a quarter of the way into it right now. Um, the biggest limiting factor for us is going to be parts. It is a 40-year-old airplane. They don't build 747 SPs anymore. There's only five other airplanes like this flying around, mostly you know, owned by casinos and very rich Saudi princes. But uh, parts are going to become a problem. We've already bought two airplanes that we parked in the Mojave Desert to cannibalize parts off of. Uh, our engines are the old Pratt Whitney JT9Ds. They don't make those anymore. There's only one place in the world that services them. So it's going to become an issue. We've bought a bunch of spare engines and spare parts, and we hope to keep it going that way. Had it to do over again, I would have started with a new airplane that cost big money, bigger money than what we have right now. So, yes, sir? Was the cost the primary reason for choosing SP? Yeah, it really was. There was some advantages as far as some of the optional equipment on SPs. We found out that when you buy one SP, it's a custom-built airplane. So every SP is unlike every other one. 
but some of the options, like as far as uh, APU and air conditioning systems, this airplane was a good fit for us, and it was free. So it still cost a lot of money to convert it, but uh, yeah, started out at a good point. <laughs> yes, sir, in the red. Um, not usually. We, uh, we do maintain them. There are periodic uh, depot maintenance stuff. We'll swap engines out. In fact, I'm taking the airplane to Germany in November. Lufthansa Technik is going to be doing the uh, C-check, what we call it. You know, we did a D-check five years ago. Now we're doing a C-check, and all four engines are going to get pulled, overhauled. Other engines will be mounted on it, so we'll have those four overhauled engines in spare. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... You know, we do run the engines a little bit higher, but we don't uh, run them beyond max continuous thrust. So they're w well within the tech order limits of the airplane, but we just burn a lot more gas doing it, as I touched on earlier. Yes, sir. Um, regarding the telescope, uh, when you open that door in flight, is there any sort of like a, a speed restriction before you open it? Nope. I get asked that a lot. It's a very common question. There's no change in handling qualities on the airplane, no noise level. Of pre you can't tell the door's opening or closing. We burn about 2% more fuel with the door open, but the airplane itself, full flight envelope. There's no issues at all. It's quite a feat of engineering. Fluid dynamics guys did their homework really well. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, about four years ago, I think it was, we ripped out the old cockpit, which was the old round dial steam gauges, and we had the old carousel nine waypoint INSs. So when you fly a 98 waypoint flight plan, every eight waypoints you're reloading flight plans in, and you can imagine how much error that could induce when you fat finger something in. So we ripped the entire cockpit out. It's kind of a Primus 1000, kind of a hybrid, kind of a Frankenstein, but it's four glass panels, two in front of each pilot, three flight management systems, dual GPS, three IRSs. And the primary reason was because when we went to Germany six years ago to show the Germans what their money went, we actually had to get State Department waivers to operate in European airspace because we didn't meet the navigational RNP requirements to go in there. They were like, you get one shot, that's it, never again. So we modernized it and it gives us a lot more flexibility, a lot more information on flight plan awareness and all that. And, uh, a lot more flexible. It's so nice being able to take a thumb drive, literally plug it into a port, and upload your entire flight plan like that instead of having to hand jam everything in over the space of about 45 minutes. So, one thing that uh, that Manny brought up, he, he mentioned the Frankenstein thing, and and that's a that's a good point. If you look across our whole fleet of aircraft, manned and unmanned, because uh, we do have an MQ9 and then Global Hawk aircraft, and then smaller unmanned uh, aircraft. As soon as we modify those things, they become one-off, unique designs. And that's a challenge for us, operating those. Not only do all of the air crew operate several different kinds of airplanes, we don't just fly one type, but each time you get in that airplane, uh, it's different than the rest of the fleet would be uh, out in the rest of the world. Even, uh, even the airplanes where we have multiples of, which is very few, say the Gulfstream G3s, we have three of those. All three of them have completely different avionics. And so when you get in one, uh, which may have been several months because you're working on other projects, uh, it's going to be look completely foreign for a few minutes, and you have to stop and think, okay, yeah, where is everything? How is the electrical system wired here? What's different? And we, we tend to be heavily uh, checklist reliant. And uh, I throw this out because I know a lot of you are involved in flying and learning to fly and everything, and that's an important thing. We, uh, you, you know, checklist discipline, you talk about things like that. We, even though all of us have eight to 10,000 hours of flying all kinds of different airplanes uh, around the world, we have to go right back to the basics and really go step by step and check and verify every step on a checklist because we use several different ones. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Uh, there, there's also a couple other airplanes. There's one that a uh, few of you asked about yesterday when we were out there uh, talking is the, uh, the ER-2, the high-altitude aircraft. Uh, you're familiar with the U-2 spy plane that's been around forever. We have two of those at NASA, and they were actually delivered straight to NASA, uh, not derived from the Air Force, but we took them from uh, Lockheed right out of the factory. 
uh, back in the 80s. And we use those for airborne science, just like some of these other things that we talked about. Uh, that one, those are unique as well, because they're completely different uh, avionics and everything than the Air Force uh, reconnaissance models of the U-2. We call them ER-2s, and uh, it's all about airborne science and earth research for us. And so our instrument package that we have on those things is typically spectrometers and other things looking down through the Earth's atmosphere from an extremely high altitude. When, uh, when I get in that and put on the spacesuit and take that thing up to 13 miles above the Earth, we can get above about 95% of the Earth's atmosphere and then study uh, the uh, chemical makeup of Earth's atmosphere, uh, as well as cloud formations, uh, aerosol flows from continent to continent, uh, different things like that. And that aircraft, as far from the pilot's perspective, flying it, uh, there, we have two of them, and uh, it's, they're Frankenstein aircraft, just like everything else we have. So you kind of have to get in there, take a deep breath, and then take it slow. And uh, it's not like jumping back in the Cessna that you've flown several times, and it's almost like you can do it blindfolded. Um, so just a, a point I want to bring up, because a lot of you are learning to fly right now. Uh, checklist discipline's a big thing for us. That never goes away. It'll keep you alive. Yeah, we always joke with the Gulf Streams, especially the hardest part of the Gulf Stream when you jump in it is, all right, where's the battery switch in this one? And you could literally spend five minutes looking for it because it's different on every airplane, especially if you've been out of it for a while. It, it, it does, actually. And, and one thing, when we talked about those one degree in increments uh, in the discussion, we kind of, you know, went, you know, click, click, click. In reality, the way that the mission director, who is downstairs watching how the, air, uh, how the uh, telescope and the instrument attached to it are performing, they're feeding us those requests for, can be one degree to the right. Those corrections only happen, they're several minutes apart. So it's, it's very gradual, it's, it's not a real tight turn. Uh, but their instruments down there, that's what all those people are doing is exactly what you're talking about. They are watching how the, uh, the lock-on, the targeting, uh, you know, the bore sight of the target is starting to drift off a little bit. And then so they'll make a correction. It's almost like a dot, okay, if it's going up in the top left part of the screen, we need to turn this way or this way, you know, one degree. And we don't wanna, we, we only do it one degree at a time for a couple reasons, one, uh, it's going to be a fine-tuned adjustment. Number two, if we go over about three degrees of bank with the, with the telescope locked onto a target, it'll break the lock. You can't maneuver with that thing, uh, you know, if you think about it for obvious reasons. It'll lose the target, and then they've got to reacquire it, so it's a, it's a very slight adjustment. Yeah, it's a real crew coordination as well. Um, you know, we're, we're watching upstairs the end of the leg coming up. We'll give the mission director a five-minute warning. They'll broadcast it on the interphone nets downstairs. Two minutes to go, one minute to go, okay, come on, because they have to cage the scope. We make our turn, they let it go for the next object, and off they go observing again. If we try to make a turn, like he said, anything more than three degrees of bank, the telescope is breaking its lock. We go into a typical 25 degree angle of bank, they're gonna be doing a complete reset of the telescope, and they're gonna lose a good 10 minutes of science. And if you do that on a 30 minute leg, well, they just lost 30% of data totally you know, out for us. It's not what we're, what we're there for. Uh, the telescope itself does have a slight uh, alignment that it can do within about one degree, so yeah, it's able to stay on track. I heard Dean mention something uh, yesterday, too, that uh, is something that I've seen where you may be in moderate turbulence and you can go downstairs and you can see the structure of the telescope and it looks as if it's moving, but it's not moving. It's stable and it's the rest of the airplane that's yeah. doing this around that. <laughs> yeah, that's a strange thing. When, it, when I go down there and, and stare at that thing and you're watching it kind of bounce around and trying to get it through my head that, no, it's the plane bouncing around it, that that thing is rock solid in space. I'm not smart enough to be able to figure that out. Sometimes I get a headache <laughs> and I just go back to the coffee maker. <laughs> yes, ma'am, you had a question. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, and for this audience, probably the most important thing we'll talk about tonight, actually. Um, 
When I, when I went into college, uh, a typical 18-year-old who wasn't really sure what they wanted to do when they grew up, if that ever happens, and uh, I went, I knew I was kind of interested in airplanes, so I went into uh, aerospace engineering. Uh, wasn't really sure why, like half the people that show up freshman year and then they're, how did I get here, what am I doing? Uh, so they changed <laughs> their majors, most of them. You guys, you guys are living that right now. Um, when I got into that, uh, my father had been a, an Air Force fighter pilot, so I kind of grew up around that. And uh, honestly, that sort of got me into the airplane thing. Otherwise, I would have never even thought of it, probably. Uh, got to uh, about the end of my sophomore year in college and decided, hey, you know, uh, when I was 18, I said, military, forget about it. I'm not into that. You know, I want to keep the hair down to my shoulders and all that kind of stuff. And and do what I want. Uh, but then I started thinking, you know, that looks pretty cool. And then as I got into college, I started to realize that, yeah, I don't, I don't mind, uh, you know, uh, a little structure in my life. And I think I can uh, mature enough to where I'd have the discipline to go down a path like that as a career. And then if I can fly, I decided I would do it. So I was uh, physically qualified, was offered a pilot slot through ROTC. And then that was how I chose my career path from there. Um, an important part of that that I'll tell you also, I was at Texas A&M in my undergrad degree in the aero department. It's, it's a great college there. I was not a high performer. In fact, I graduated with a 2.27 grade point average. I don't think you're even allowed to do that these days. They'll kick you out well prior to that. I was kind of sent out on a sort of a drug deal where, where the dean of the college said, all right, you know, we're going to give you the degree and let you slide out kind of barely squeaking by only because you're going in the military and you got to promise us you will never go into industry as an aerospace engineer. <laughs> and if and definitely don't tell them where you got your degree. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I went through the Air Force, stayed in for 25 years, had a great time, and I was trying to get my hands on every airplane I could. So I flew a variety of different airplanes, kind of an unusual career path for an Air Force pilot. Uh, I started out in B-52s, flew T-37s, uh, KC-10s for about three years, uh, T-38s is what most of my time ended up being, and I flew uh, U-2s for six years switched to uh, F-117 stealth fighters for about four years, and you know I just basically got kicked out of every community I was ever in and uh, went on to something else. But that was kind of what I wanted to do. Same kind of thing that motivates a lot of test pilots. And um, after that career, I thought uh, flying was probably done. Still would have never imagined that I was going to be an aerospace engineer, but that was the academic area that still interested me. And so that's why about halfway through that career, uh, I decided, hey, I need to get a master's degree, but I want to still do it in this area. And when I found out that Embry-Riddle had a Master of Aeronautical Science, I was like, man, that's, that's what I want. How do I get there? I'm, I'm doing a full-time job as a stealth fighter pilot in New Mexico, and luckily, Embry-Riddle, I mean, the, the vision that uh, the forefathers have had at Embry-Riddle here on making this accessible worldwide uh, was incredible. And back when I was doing this a long time ago, it was one of the few schools that actually had the ability to do that before a lot of this internet and everything else. And so I'm very thankful to have had the chance to go to Embry-Riddle and be able to get a, a quality master's degree in an area that I was interested in. And then that has actually helped me. And the reason I bring that up, not just because a bunch of Embry-Riddle people are sitting here, but that helped me get hired by NASA when I went on to career number two. So time to leave the Air Force five years ago, got tired of being a colonel flying a desk, said, hey, this, this looks like an opportunity that I thought I would never have, and got a call from one of my buddies flying that high altitude plane and said, hey, you might be the guy we're looking for. And so I applied, but having that, uh, that Embry-Riddle degree actually kind of topped off my, my previously poor looking academic record and uh, helped me get that job, actually. So that's the path to where I am now. My, uh, my path was a little different. I, uh, about six years old, had a, had a flight in a, some sort of Cessna out of a, a grass field in Ohio. And from that moment on, I, that, was, that was a spark that I, that I needed. I knew I wanted to do something with airplanes somehow, somewhere, anywhere at the time. And 
I, uh, I finished up high school and uh, had a local C-130 guard unit that I thought, oh, this, this looks like something that looks like fun, and uh, joined the guard unit. I became a mechanic, became a flight engineer, and, and did that for a while. Uh, uh, that paid my way through college at Ohio State at the time. I uh, was looking at getting a pilot slot, and uh, at the time, uh, I was kind of waffling around in uh, in architecture school and had, uh, had prior to that changed uh, from a double E and uh, was uh, really not knowing exactly what I was going to do and, and had it offered to me, well, you know, you, you, we may have a pilot slot available for you and... Uh, Okay, that, that sounds really good. What can I get a degree in really quick? So I ended up with an art history degree. And at the same time, found out that my uh, vision didn't qualify for the, the pilot program, which was all good, well and good for me. Um, I, I loved being a flight engineer and, and, uh, and uh, managed to find my way into uh, a couple of airlines. Uh, United Airlines happened to be the one that uh, uh, at the time around uh, 2002 or so was originally intended to, to operate and uh, maintain the Sofia airplane, and, and it was supposed to be crewed by United United crews, and uh, managed to uh, get hooked up with a few fellows there, and and uh, we we were working. I was working flight manuals and procedures, and uh, September 11th came along, and the United decided it wasn't something that they wanted to keep doing, so we uh, we continued on, the small group of us that uh, uh, that were with the program there, stayed right with it as it went over to NASA, and uh, that was about 15 years ago. So I personally have been uh, f uh, working as a flight engineer on, on SOFIA, and uh, just as uh, uh, these folks are, these fellows are uh, involved in other airplanes, uh, same sort of thing where, yeah, hey, okay, you're sitting at your desk right now. No, no, let's let's find something else for you to do. And uh, we also, fortunately for me, uh, flight engineer-wise, yeah, the the, the seven four, the one that we have, still has a flight engineer position. We also have a DC eight, and I uh, flight engineer on that one as well. And that's that's another uh, really uh, uh, Frankenstein, as you say, or or we look at it sometimes. It's got so many probes sticking out of windows and. And, uh, and lasers bouncing out the top and bottom of the plane and gravimeters and uh, we call it a porcupine because it's got so many different uh, uh, devices that are attached to it that it's, uh, we really don't know what kind of drag we have with the thing but we know that every time we, we uh, make a modification to the plane, we take it up, we do a shake flight, we do an engineering flight. Hey, is everything, oh wait a minute, what's that that I hear? Okay, there's something going on with the airplane and. You know, we have to figure that out before we take it out and fly it down over Antarctica from, from southern Chile, three hours down to the continent, uh, flying low level down, then down over Antarctica for about six hours and then back up to, to Chile. So that's, that's just some of the stuff that we do with, with uh, some, of the, some of the larger platforms that we have. So that's my story. Yes, it's my turn. Uh, a lot of similarities between these two guys and me. The GPA thing, yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, when I went to school 150 years ago, the drinking age was still 18, and we had beer on campus, and I discovered beer when I was 18. My GPA was uh, suffering because of that. Uh, I was in the ROTC program as well. Of course, I wanted to be a pilot ever since I was six years old when I got my first 707 flight from New York to Athens to go visit grandparents and uh, got to go in the cockpit well before 9-11. And I was like, that's it. This is what I want to do for a living, you know, ever since I was six years old. Joined the ROTC program, won a pilot slot. No way, you wear glasses. Maybe you can have a navigator slot. Uh, they don't have that restriction anymore, obviously, but, you know, you can have up to, like, 2070 or something right now uh, and still get pilot training. Um, so I started out life as a navigator. Uh, you know, went through navigator school when it was in Sacramento. Had a great time out there. Wanted a fighter. Wanted to be backseat of an F-4. Uh, I got a B-52 to Loring, Maine. And uh, you know what, crazy assignment, had a great time up there, probably the best squadron I was ever in. Uh, while I was up there, you know, I still had this uh, inkling to try to be a pilot. And um, somebody said, well, you gotta fill out this form, put this package together, get the wing commander to sign it for you. Walked up to the wing commander, said, sir, I wanna be a pilot. And he goes, good on you. He goes, I started out life as a nav too. Yeah, you wanna be a pilot? Cool, how many hours do you have? Uh, 
He goes, come back in my office when you got at least 20 hours. So I went down to the local FBO and started look, taking private, you know, lessons in a Piper, Cessna, sound familiar? For those of you that are doing it right now, went back in, applied, got to go to pilot training as a senior officer. I was a captain, all the rest were lieutenants, so I got to be the class leader on top of being a, a student at pilot training. Uh, did pretty well in pilot training. They offered me an F-15. I said, nope, I want to go back to that B-52. And they were like, really? I'm like, I had a great time in that airplane. I know that airplane well. I want to go back. I know the command. I know how they do things there. So I went back to the B-52, uh, distinguished grad out of, of uh, B-52 school. Uh, did that for like three more years, and then the base got closed because of the drawdowns of the forces and transitioned to the E-3 AWACS. Great airplane to fly, gone from home way too many days a year. On average, about 230 to 300 days a year gone. It was a schedule was six weeks out, two weeks home, six weeks out, two weeks home. And when I was home, I wasn't really home because there's always follow-on training or a, a mini deployment on a local, like red flag, green flag, maple flag. So I, we were always gone. And I've got a wife and three little kids and so one day I got a phone call. Hey, you're on a non-volunteer list. Oh, no. Where am I going? You're going to Wright-Patterson Air Base, Dayton, Ohio. What? You're going to be a human factors engineer. A what? You're going to help design future cockpits. Okay, that's cool. How did I get that? You know, how did I get on that list? Well, you got a human factors uh, minor with a psychology degree, and human factors falls under psych. Boom, you're going. Picked up the phone, called the wife. And this was all I was deployed when I got this phone call. Hey, honey, guess what? She's like, where are we going now? She was sharp that day, you know, sharp woman. Pack your bags, we're leaving in six weeks, and oh, I'll be home every night for dinner. She's like, thank God, when do I pack? I'm like, right now, we're leaving in about five weeks. So went to Wright-Patterson Air Base, had a great time, had a facility with about seven different simulators. I got to do work on the F-22 when it was still just our simulator. Uh, worked on cockpit modernization on the T-38s, the KC-135, uh, argued intensively with an engineer that this piece of glass will not replace a navigator on a tanker, and he told me to leave the building, and I went, fine, it's still not going to replace a nav, even if you throw me out. But I uh, got to work on that, got to work on some B-1 bomber stuff, some real-time information in the cockpit, Link-16, all that uh, different acronyms they called it. Uh, had a great time there, and then I picked up the phone one day and called personnel and went, okay, What's next for me? And the guy looked at my file and went, oh, AWACS instructor. And I went, no, 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 no. I've already done that. Give me something else. And he goes, no, 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 no. So I left the airlines at that point, right? I left for the, for the airlines at that point. This was 1998. Uh, basically left January 5th from the Air Force. And January 6th, I was in ground school at Southern Air Transport learning about 747s. Uh, was with them for 10 months. And the company went bankrupt while I was in a holding pattern over London. That was a fun ride home. Um, that was actually an interesting radio call from uh, ground personnel saying, dispatch needs to talk to you. Here's your phone patch called by my dispatcher back in Columbus, Ohio. And she said, we need to talk to all three of you when you land. And the captain, of course, goes, no, find out what she wants. And I went, uh, captain wants to know now. She's like, I really don't want to tell you over the radio, Manny. I'm like, Captain wants to know what, he, what you got. She goes, well, we're bankrupt as of 3 o'clock this morning. Call us for further instructions. And I was like, whoa! <laughs> and there was an Atlas Air 7-4 stacked on top of us in the holding pattern. He just goes, dude, can't believe she just told you that over the radio. <laughs> like, I know, are you hiring? He goes, yeah, I think we are. If we're parking next to you, I'll be right over with my business card. Uh, it worked out well. I got hired at Airborne Express like two weeks later. Uh, flew for Airborne Express flying freight for three years. Great company. You know, again, backside of the clock. And I'm like, I'm done with night flying. Yeah, no, I'm not. Um, so I was like, I need to go fly for a real airline. So I got hired at American Airlines. You know, got my dream assignments, flying 737-800 out of Chicago. Life is good. Welcome to the Millionaire's Club is what the chief pilot told us in a setting just like this with all us students and wives sitting up there. Uh, my first week of flying for them was the week of 9-11. I flew right past the Twin Towers on September 9th. And it was exciting for me because I grew up in New Jersey and there's Rutgers University and there's my house and this, the Twin Towers, literally could reach out and touch them. Flew back to Chicago on September 10th, flew home that night to Sacramento, and of course, the morning of, you know, the phone's ringing off the hook from all my relatives and friends going, are you okay? And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's 6.30 in the morning. Why are you calling me? Turn on the TV. 
So that was it for me. I got furloughed from American 20 days later. Uh, from there, I ended up back in the Air Force, you know, got reactivated, full-time guy working Predator stuff at the factory, delivering Predator aircraft to the Air Force, uh, picking up the phone from Don Rumsfeld, my first week there, Secretary of the Air Force, and I'm Secretary of Defense, and I'm going, yes, sir, how can I help you? And he's like, you got a blank check, put some weapons on that stupid airplane before we keep losing bin Laden in the camera over it, because it was unarmed at that point. So we had six weeks to take basically a, a large cache of money and figure out how to put weapons on that airplane. That's why Predators are armed now, because of the group I work with was called Big Safari. It's Air Force Special Projects. So we got to do the weaponization of the, of the uh, UAVs over there in that office. So high tempo, high stress. It was a lot of fun, though. You know, I had a good group of people I worked with. Uh, from there, uh, I flew for a couple more airlines. I did Flexjet, you know, regional, you know, fractional ownership of Learjets. Got to fly that. That was a greater little airplane. My last airline was JetBlue. And this is where NASA comes in. I was actually working at NASA as a part-time safety guy, filling out hazard reports for upcoming test flights. Uh, in fact, that one where you saw the F-18 in the video going straight down and then it showed the Mars rover, we actually, I actually wrote the hazard report on that because they were testing the radar in a nose down attitude. So one day I was doing my safety work, working in a cubicle, lots of paperwork, and running a system safety working group each week to get hazards disposition with the pilot team. Pilots were in the back of the room talking about how their navigator retired. Where are we going to find another navigator? I used to be a nav, and the room got real quiet as I went back to typing my minutes, and they were all staring at me. Really? You were a nav? You want to be one again? Sure. You don't mind not being a pilot? No. Go. Cool. Go tell your boss you're no longer in safety, you're in flight ops, and figure out what to do with JetBlue. So I went over to my boss at JetBlue and said, hey, chief, guess what? He goes, well, you're going to take the opportunity, aren't you? I'm like, yeah. He goes, don't quit on me. Take a year leave of absence. If you hate it, come back. No harm, no foul. Thanks, boss. Really good chief pilot. Did it for a year. Three weeks in as a navigator, I'm on our DC-8 aircraft flying low level over the Antarctic ice cap. <laughs> what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> Try, trying to remember how to be a navigator all over again. Uh, it's, a, it's a neat job being a nav and a mission planner for, for NASA. You basically interface with the customer, with the scientists, converting science data to flight data to give to the pilots and do all that. Three years of that, chief pilot came up to me said, hey, didn't you tell me you flew 7.4s at one time? I'm like, yeah, boss, my first airline. Got a type rating out of it, too. The only good thing I got from Southern Air Transport. Let me see your license. Okay. Tell you what, show up tomorrow dressed to fly. There's nothing fly tomorrow. Show up tomorrow dressed to fly. Yeah, boss, okay. I showed up. We go into a briefing room. He throws the manual at me from the King Air, the Beach 200 King Air. Learn all you can. We're flying in 45 minutes. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I've never flown a turboprop, so I went in the book and looked at numbers and went, all right, takeoff speed's 95 knots. Hey, look at that, landing speed's 95 knots. Just remember 95, if nothing else. So we went up into the uh, Edwards Range work area. I did steep turns, stalls, falls. You guys are doing that right now, right? Guess what? Did the same thing there. Shot a couple of ILS approaches, landed, and I'm like, all right, Frank, what the hell was all that about? That was your interview flight. We'll let you know in a few weeks. Would have been nice to know about 20 minutes ago. Luckily, about three months went by, actually four months. Pack your bags, you're going to Denver for two weeks, you're training on the Sophia with Jim, who's flying tonight. Really? Yeah, you're hired. Oh, wow, yeah, you're gonna be our 747 pilot. And I was the only guy with a type rating at the time for several years until the, guy, the guys that are line pilots on it now, because at NASA we're self-certifying, well, they finally went out and got a formal type rating on the airplane, so all of us have that now. And that's how I started working here. You know, two, about a year later, I called up Jim at JetBlue and thanks, it's done. And uh, about three years ago, American finally called me back. And I was like, no thanks. And she's like, what are you doing now? Well, I'm flying for NASA. Oh, that's kind of not, what, who? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm <laughs> flying for NASA. So that's how I got here, you know, to a very non-traditional way. Most of our pilots are Air Force test pilot school grads, and then they come over to NASA. But all three of us are the examples of non-traditional ways to get to NASA. So don't ever poo-poo any opportunities to uh, pick up some experience. No matter what it is, it'll come back and pay dividends later. Uh, you know, we, uh, the support structure for all of us, I can say, probably speak for all of us, 
The wives are the biggest you know, supporters of, of our careers and our jobs. My wife understands I get paid to go away. Sometimes she's looking forward to, when's your next trip? Get out of my way, you know. Uh, so one month a year, for sure, I'm down in New Zealand. She knows that. Every year I'm going to be gone for four weeks. Something like this, three or four days out in Florida, yeah, this is easy. You know, based on what I did in the military, this is a piece of cake. Most of our, local, our sorties, though, are local. So, I, you know, we have that advantage to where we fly during the day and come home at night or fly all night long and get in bed by sunrise. So, but yeah, the family is very important. We couldn't do it without the support of our families. Agreed? <laughs> yeah. When uh, we were talking a little while ago, think back, because you guys are right at the beginning of your careers here. Um, we mentioned that, uh, okay, how did you make the decision to start down a certain path? You know, one thing that was important, like when I mentioned earlier, I got, you know, about a year and a half into college and then realized, okay, I could, I could do that military thing, you know, two years ago. I was like, no way, never doing that. Um, what I found was uh, surrounding uh, myself with, with great people, some that had similar interests, uh, but good quality people, and you guys have already done that. That's step one. Make sure that you're in, in the right crowd, and the right crowd is people moving in a certain direction. And everybody in this room is already doing that. So you've already succeeded at that, whether you know it or not. What you'll find in the next few decisions you make on which path your life and career is going to take is that you'll do the same thing, just at a different level. And, a different, and you'll fine-tune that group a little bit more each time. And, and eventually, when you, if you find yourself uncomfortable and you're just not happy in the, in the occupation, part of that may be the people that are surrounding you, the ones that are giving you advice, the ones that you talk with every day, or your bosses, or the people that work for you. If you're in the right group, you'll know it, and you'll, you'll be satisfied with it. And that's kind of how you move down a certain career path. Uh, another comment I'll make on that also is that always have a backup plan. It's just like flying airplanes. Never, never be heading down a path anywhere where you have no way out if something goes wrong that you're not going to see coming. Always have a backup plan. That, that worked for me personally uh, several times along my career, all the way up into my 50s. Um, whenever I was charging down one path, and I, I think what you just heard from Manny, I know he did that several times, where he had a good backup plan to fall back on, whether it was being furloughed by an airliner uh, or whatever. Uh, each, each step of the way, uh, for instance, in my military career, you know, from the five-year point on, I was trying to find a path to get out and maybe go be an airline pilot or do something different. Um, that exit plan kept failing me. But one thing I had always done along the way was knowing that something could change, uh, surprise me in my life uh, at any time, I made sure that I had another path that I was paving along the way. Uh, for instance, I went out at uh, one, I was at about the 14 year point in, in the uh, military, and I went out and uh, got a 737 type rating. Uh, I got an ATP license, even though I had never done any civilian flying and never really planned on it, but I needed to have that homework done and have some of the uh, money in the bank in case I did decide to do that. At the same time, I was going to advanced schools, getting my master's degree at Embry-Riddle, and working on some Air Force professional development courses that they make us take for promotion. And so I was driving down both of those paths. And sure enough, it was another year or two after that before I started deciding which path I was going to take. But I was ready for either one, and that helped me out a lot. I mentioned also switching between airplanes. And when I told you I got kicked out of basically every Air Force community there was, well, the reality, of course, is the way that went down was I made the decision when I was flying a certain airplane, and apparently I have a short attention span, but there was another adventure out there that I wanted to go after. And so when I was, uh, say, a, a KC-10 pilot, but I wanted to put on a spacesuit and fly that cool high-altitude plane, be single seat, and do, all, do something unique, um, I, I had to knock on that door several times. And for all of you, whatever path you decide when you walk out the doors here, the answer is going to be no initially when you ask the question 80% of the time. No, your, your vision's not good enough, you're too tall, too short, too young. A week later they'll tell you you're too old, too ugly, whatever. The answer is always going to be no. And don't let that stop you. Because I guarantee you, I, I never would have thought 20 years ago or even 10 years ago I was in the middle of a fairly successful military career, but my chances for working for NASA, those were gone forever. 
you know. But I kept looking, I kept knocking on the door, you may have one opportunity, and don't be afraid to go after it. And when they tell you, no, nah, that's not gonna work, keep asking, keep after it. Uh, always have that backup plan, but don't ever take no for an answer right off the bat, because 80% of the time, that's gonna be the answer. If you wanna apply for a graduate school degree, wherever that is, or an internship somewhere, uh, keep knocking on that door. Uh, you'll be surprised, and you'll always be surprised, I always was, when finally that yes answer comes back and you're like, really, are you kidding? I thought this wasn't an option for me. There's options out there all the time. And as you find different inter uh, interests, just don't let them tell you no. Uh, go back, reset, better prepare, take other courses, whatever you need to do, and then go after it and knock on that door again. That's the way you'll find yourself surrounded by people that you want to be surrounded by, and you'll enjoy what you're doing. So don't, don't forget that. If there's, this is all sexy, cool stuff we're talking about here, but it, I wish somebody had told me that a little bit better when I was your age. Don't give up. Just to tag on with uh, Dean, that's uh, something that I, the attitude I've always had is, uh, uh, I, I've always thought of myself as fairly opportunistic. You know, there I've, I've had folks come to me, hey, can you do this? Yeah, absolutely. What, what, what am I doing exactly? And, and you don't always know what it's gonna entail, but uh, you're gonna have opportunities. Sometimes you're gonna get warning flags and you'll decide not to do something, but uh, try and make yourself as absolutely, you know, if it's an opportunity that you, you think is, hey, this, this would look good on my resume, or this is a good skill to have, you know, take all those opportunities that you can and, and doors are gonna open up for you that you wouldn't have thought would open up. And, uh, and yeah, those things that, uh, as Dean said, uh, you know, and he, he thought there was no chance he'd ever end up working for NASA. For a farm boy like me who, you know, it saw astronauts going up in the Apollo rockets, the late Apollo rockets and, and the space shuttle. Hey, I want to be an astronaut, you know? Okay, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, that's what are the percentage, percentages of, of actually being able to, you know, to be an astronaut. I feel like uh, for me, uh, being a flight engineer with NASA is, uh, and, and some of the stuff that I'm working with and on is, uh, I feel like I've, I've hit pretty close to the mark for what I originally set out to do, so. Uh, uh, keep your eyes open for every opportunity that you can. And like I say, don't uh, get every skill and, and, uh, and have fun while you're doing it too. If it's, not, if it's not fun to you and exciting to you, then yeah, change, change something, do something else.